Um, Today's scripture reading is from Luke chapter 20, verse 27 through 28, uh, verse 4. And you'll find that on page 880 in the Pew Bibles if you're using one of those. Um, There came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection, and they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children, and the second and the third took her, and likewise all seven... uh, left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as a wife. And Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared ask him any questions. But he said to them, How can they say that the Christ is David's son. For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for, the pre- for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to gather this morning, and indeed we want to fix our eyes on Jesus. And so as we go to your word, we thank you that therein we can see the face of Jesus Christ in the hearing of the gospel. And so I pray for these moments that you'd be gracious to us and that you'd be present among us, that through the preaching of your word, you'd be pleased to give this church faith and that we would trust you and that you would give us grace to set our affections on the resurrection that is to come and that that would transform how we live here and how we love one another. So we give this time to you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We just finished a wonderful celebration of Easter, didn't we? Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday. What a wonderful time it was to fix our eyes on the resurrected Christ. The music was great. Our sermon series, The Death of Death, was helpful and encouraging. The services were all happy and full. We've even had consecutive days with sun and 70 degree temperatures. Even Vermont weather is celebrating the resurrection. Thursday evening, our community group sat outside under the stars and shared with one another how significant the death and resurrection of Christ was for us. It's mind-blowing, one person said. It's so important, it's so central, added another member of our group. We just marveled at the grace of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. Jesus didn't stay in the grave. Christ is risen He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. How have you been doing this past week, living with this truth in your hearts and in your minds? But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Mitch encouraged us last Sunday to transcend our circumstances with this Easter truth from 1 Corinthians 15, 
20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. I'm wondering how you've done this week. That truth can, it can revolutionize your thinking because Christ's resurrection is a game changer. It can begin to redirect your hearts away from this world and to Christ himself. But I suspect as you evaluate yourselves that you see room for improvement. You can probably relate to the father who cried out in Mark 9, 24, I believe, help my unbelief. The resurrection of Jesus can help your faith. But you're still in need of growth, aren't you? You still fall short. Your hearts can still seem sluggish and and myopic. And so you can resonate with help my unbelief. So because you could use more help with your faith, with your resurrection faith, let's look together at Luke chapter 20, which again is found on page 880 if you're using a pew Bible. Here, as we return to our study in the Gospel of Luke, there is more help to be found. Your faith in the resurrection can be nurtured, and the implications of the resurrection for you as a church can be bolstered and made to be a greater reality. How does your resurrection enable you to more eagerly give up all that you have for Christ's sake? How does the promise of a future resurrection help you to renounce all that you have, just as Jesus required back in Luke 14, verse 13? 33. This is what our passage for this morning is designed to address. We're examining the text from chapter 20, verse 27, to chapter 21, verse 4, the the passage that Angela just read. And you can follow along with a cream-colored outline in your bulletin if you'd like to. As we re-enter Luke, remember that Jesus has arrived at Jerusalem. For many chapters, we followed his journey away from Galilee and Samaria to the holy city, the place of his crucifixion. And now he's here. The hostility against him is intensifying. Jesus has pronounced judgment on Jerusalem. He's condemned Israel's leaders. The Pharisees have been rebuked. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people are seeking to destroy him. All of Israel's leaders are intent in trapping Jesus. They pursue him and hope to catch him in something that he says so that they can lay hands on him and deliver him over to the authorities. And here in our passage, this this plotting, this scheming continues now with a group called the Sadducees. They're introduced in verse 27. Luke tells us that they deny the resurrection. We also know from Acts 23, 8 that they also say there are no angels, no spirits. It seems that the Sadducees held to a literal reading of the Torah, the five books of Moses, and they discounted all other parts of the Old Testament, and they discounted oral tradition. And this set them at odds with the Pharisees and most of the other Jewish leaders. So now the Sadducees are in the mix, giving their best effort to confound the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they ask Jesus a trick question in verse 28, rooted in the law of leverate marriage. Teacher, Moses wrote for us in Deuteronomy 25, 5, from the Torah, that if a man's brother dies having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. He must perform the duty of a brother-in-law. He must do this like Onan was supposed to do in Genesis chapter 38, but failed to do, refused to do, and as Boaz nobly did, if you remember, when he married Ruth and had Obed. Leverate marriage, the duty of a brother-in-law, was meant to preserve, preserve the tribal heritage in Israel. It was designed to perpetuate the family name so that the inheritance would continue. An inheritance, obviously, that was dependent upon offspring. The Sadducees here misused this important teaching from the Torah and they craft an absurd story about it. They speak hypothetically about a woman who marries seven different husbands through leverate marriage. And they all come and go. And there's no offspring, and then the woman herself dies. So now everything being equal, no one of these husbands has an advantage. Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? That's the question. And the absurdity of the scenario is supposed to expose the absurdity of the resurrection. So the Sadducees think that they've trapped Jesus. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Can God create a rock too heavy that he can't lift it? Aha! We've got you. No resurrection. 
Jesus listens to their misuse of Scripture. He hears their rejection of resurrection, and then he confronts their unbelief. First, he teaches them about resurrection, showing them what true faith looks like. And then he proves resurrection from the Torah, right on their own turf, right from the book of Moses. So in verses 34 through 36, Jesus teaches about resurrection, and he overturns the Sadducees' thinking. They imagine much similarity between earthly life and the purported resurrection. But Jesus shows that the age to come is radically different than the current age. The sons of this age, he says in verse 34, marry and are given in marriage. The sons of this age are simply all those who live in this world, earthly citizens. We saw the same thing back in Luke 16 when in verse 8 of that chapter, Jesus said the sons of this world, or the sons of this age, it's the same word, are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And so the sons of this age are people in this world going about their regular business, managing commodities, making investments, marrying wives, finding husbands. In contrast, note the word but in verse 35, in contrast to the sons of this age, those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. In other words, those who have faith to enter the kingdom of God await an age that will be radically different There will be no marriage in the resurrection. Marriage is a temporary institution. That's why John Piper wrote the book, This Momentary Marriage. Why? Why? Verse 36, because believers in that age can't die anymore. In that that age, death is no longer. In the resurrection, it's impossible to die. And the need for procreation and offspring to perpetuate an inheritance is no longer needed. It's ended. The resurrection is the inheritance, the ultimate inheritance. So marriage will be no more. You see, Christian, in the age of resurrection, you will be angel-like, Jesus says. You'll be immortal. This imperishable will have put on immortality. And you will experience full and complete sonship. You will be a son of God without caveat in the most complete sense possible. You will see Jesus as he is, and you will be with him, and you will be like him. That's what it means to be sons of the resurrection, brothers and sisters. That's what Jesus says in verse 36. And to support his teaching about resurrection, Jesus directs the Sadducees to Exodus chapter 3. In verse 37 of our text, he says, But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed, Sadducees, in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Three times that phrase is repeated in Exodus chapter 3, after Moses turns to the Lord in the burning bush. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, And the God of Jacob. This statement that God makes to Moses is a statement of covenant promise. Say this to the people of Israel, God tells Moses in Exodus 3.14. I am has sent me to you. Say this to the people of Israel, it continues in Exodus 3. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all. All generations, I promise that I will bring you up out of affliction, out of the affliction of Egypt. That's all from Exodus chapter 3. God states his name, I am who I am. And he mentions the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he declares his promise, which recalls the covenant he made with those fathers, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus brings this passage before the Sadducees from their own scriptures, from the Torah, the books of Moses. And what's the punchline? Verse 38. Now, he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Ah, there it is. God is God of the living. He knows and loves people who are alive, 
He is life and he gives life to his covenant people who are therefore alive. He has given them eternal life according to his covenant which will stand forever. Or to put it negatively, God is not the God of non-existent beings. At the time of Exodus 3, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have all died. But God is still their God. So even after death, they yet live. Only living people can have a God. And moreover, I want you to catch this, God's covenant with them still stands. God made great, he made great promises to the patriarchs, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in this life, in this age, they didn't receive the things promised, did they? This is said plainly in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. These all died in faith, that includes the fathers, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were looking to the age to come. Their hope was where? On the resurrection. That's where their hope was fixed. So, Sadducees, not only is there a resurrection, but therein lies hope for the people of God. God's covenant with his people is a covenant of resurrection. All live to him, and all will live to him in that age to come, the age of resurrection. This has been God's plan from the dawn of time, and it's built into the scriptures from the very beginning. The Sadducees have to misuse and twist scripture in order to deny it, even though it's plain right there in their own Torah. After all, even the law of Leverite marriage pointed to resurrection. The offspring that was to come was Jesus Christ himself, and the heritage that will be his will come through the resurrection. He will perpetuate his name to all who are sons of Abraham by faith and give them an eternal heritage, a resurrection inheritance where death is no more. By the way, the scripture reality of the resurrection, God's promise of resurrection was was the ground of Jesus' hope that gave him the confidence he needed as he faced the cross. Remember, Jesus is fast approaching the cross here in Luke We're not far from chapter 22 where Jesus will pray earnestly and in agony, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, not my will, but yours be done. As Jesus neared the place of his death and as he anticipated the suffering of the cross, his solace, his comfort, his courage came from the promise of resurrection. His poise, his self-control, his resolve were all anchored in resurrection hope. This was the joy that was set before him. This is what enabled him to give his life and lay it down for sinners like you and me. This is faith at work. In Jesus, we, dis- we see a display of faith as he entrusted himself to his heavenly Father and as he believed God's covenant to him was sure and that he could bank all his hope on that covenant. And as we celebrated last week, God the Father made good on his promise to Jesus. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And all who are united to him by faith have the same hope. They will be counted worthy to attain to that age, to the resurrection from the dead, not on account of their own merit, but on account of Christ's merit, purchased for them through the cross and credited to them by faith alone. And they will become sons of of the resurrection. As Mitch preached last week, death will be swallowed up in victory. Marriage will fade as a distant memory. Our union with Christ will be completely consummated. Our sonship will be made whole and there will be unspeakable pleasures at God's right hand. Fullness of joy experienced without compromise. That's your hope, brother and sister. That's what you have to look forward to. Well, the Sadducees have been taken to school. Jesus did a little resurrection 101 with them, and they have nothing more to say. In fact, look at verses 39 and 40. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well. They like Jesus' response. They like that Jesus has stuck it to the Sadducees. The scribes were closely associated with the Pharisees, and they would have held to the resurrection. So they see this as a win for their camp. Jesus You've spoken well in refuting the Sadducees. Way to go. 4, verse 40, 
they no longer dared ask him any question. I take they, in verse 40 here, to refer to the Sadducees. The scribes are pleased because the Sadducees no longer dared to ask any more questions. They like that the Sadducees have been silenced. But now that they've spoken up, they've given Jesus an invitation to address them. So look how Jesus turns it in verse 41. But he said to them, You think it's fun that the Sadducees were silent? Try this question on for size, scribes. How can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord. So how is he his son? There's my question for you, scribes. How can they say that the Christ is David's son? Now, it was common knowledge in Israel that the Christ, the Messiah, would be David's son. You know that. The Messiah would be a descendant of David. The anticipated Messiah was given the title Son of David. It was widely accepted that he would come to reign as king over Israel by setting up an earthly rule over Jerusalem, ruling this age with political and legal power on the earth. So the premise that the Christ is David's son is assumed with the scribes. But the question is difficult because of what Psalm 110 verse 1 says. It says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And Jesus invites the scribes to do a little study of this verse. The Lord, that's Yahweh, the Lord God, says to my Lord, that's the Messiah, David's Messiah. David is the author of Psalm 110. So David says, the Lord, Yahweh, says to my Lord, referring to the Messiah. And then the remaining phrase is what Yahweh says to the Messiah. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Do you see that? So here's the conundrum for the scribes. The great King David would never have referred to his son as Lord. Sons would call their fathers Lord. Solomon could have called David Lord. But fathers would never call their sons Lord. David wouldn't have said that about Solomon. Unless, unless David was looking forward in time and could see that one of his descendants would be the divine Messiah, the God-man who would rule and reign at God's right hand as Lord of heaven and earth. David, by faith, could see the day when Messiah would be seated at God's right hand as king, not ruling over an earthly political people, but ruling over a realm much higher and much greater. By faith, David was anticipating a greater king who would rule on a heavenly throne, a greater throne. So what we have in Psalm 110.1 is the revelation of a divine dialogue within the Godhead. The Father is saying to the Son, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. We see this elsewhere, by the way. For example, Psalm 2. In that psalm we read, The Lord said to me, You are my Son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. That's the Father talking to the Son. That's the Father making the Son a promise. And it was a resurrection promise. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he was begotten of God and he was given full sonship. That's what Acts 13.33 teaches explicitly. In his resurrection, Jesus was the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He ascended into heaven as a son of the resurrection, ready to one day make his people sons of the resurrection, just like him. And so likewise in Psalm 110.1, the Messiah is given a promise from the Lord. Sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. It was because of Christ's resurrection that God made good on this promise. First, Messiah would humbly suffer. He would die as an atoning sacrifice for sin, propitiating God's wrath and receiving the just penalty for sinners. And then he would be raised from the dead and would ascend to God's right hand. And there, there on the heavenly throne of David, he would be crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. And one day, one day, at the last trump, God will make all enemies a footstool for Christ's feet. That great day when you and I, church, are given the grace to become sons of the resurrection. And this is what the scribes are missing. They are missing the substance of what the scriptures teach about the Messiah. Note how they respond to Jesus' question. Jesus asks in verse 44, David thus calls him Lord. David calls the Messiah Lord. 
So how is he his son? And what do the scribes say? What's their reply? Crickets. Like the Sadducees, they have nothing to say. They have the Scriptures. In fact, they're teachers of the law, but they're missing it. They're misunderstanding the Scriptures, and they're denying the Messiah. Jesus is standing right there in front of them. He has come down from heaven to redeem Israel, and they're blind in their unbelief. They're dull in their unbelief. They have no understanding of Scriptures because of their unbelief. And unbelief has produced hypocrisy in these teachers. In verses 45 through 47, Jesus warns his disciples and and all the surrounding people about the arrogant religious unbelief of the scribes. Look with me at Luke chapter 20, verses 45 through 47. And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. Unbelief in religious people always, always breeds arrogant hypocrisy. The sinful heart remains unchanged, wicked as ever, but religious activity and external man-made efforts to look pious give a platform for pride. And the scribes are arrogant religious hypocrites. And Jesus confronts them and he warns of their behavior. They like to walk around in long robes. This is over-the-top clothing meant to impress those who are religiously minded. Full-length, fancy apparel with long fringes, flashy tassels. They love greetings in the marketplace. This is the attention garnered from formal recognition in public. They, They crave public attention. They love the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts. They long for glory. They long for honor, to be esteemed as teachers and leaders. So they lust after the first seats and they lust after the first places in order to flaunt their reputation and to be seen by men. All of this is outward religious show. It's vainglory. It's not true religion. True religion as James describes it. Religion that's pure and undefiled before God the Father. James says rather that true religion is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. True religion is faith-filled generosity toward downtrodden covenant brothers and sisters. It's humble service to those among the believing community who are in need. It's love for the brethren. It's loving your neighbor as yourself. It's honoring widows, not seeking honor for yourself. But look at what the scribes do next in verse 47. They devour widows' houses. This means they cheat weak and vulnerable widows for their own selfish gain. They find a way to manipulate and oppress those who are in greatest need rather than gently and and tenderly care for them. This is religious hypocrisy. Outwardly deceptive show with inwardly unloving hearts. And also for a pretense, they make long prayers. This is prayer for appearance only. Prayer meant to display a show of outward piety, not genuine communion with God. Again, religious hypocrisy. Outward performance, inward godlessness. And for these reasons, the scribes, Jesus says, will receive a greater condemnation. They will be judged according to the severity of their unbelief. For the Lord sees... Not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart, doesn't he? And when Jesus looks upon the hearts of the scribes, he sees arrogant, religious unbelief. That's what he sees. But the verses in our final section of text are a sweet, sweet relief. If you're feeling a little parched by all the unbelief of the Sadducees and the scribes, here's a cool drink of water. So read with me. Chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. 
Here we see the faith of a poor widow, her Christ-like sacrificial faith. She stands out boldly against the backdrop of unbelief that we've seen thus far. Not only that, but the scribes were just condemned for devouring widows' houses. Now Jesus observes a poor widow who's displaying commendable faith. What a contrast. And this contrast is highlighted even more vibrantly in verse 1. Jesus first observes the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. They're probably depositing large gifts, maybe even with a little pomp. Certainly the Sadducees and the scribes would be counted among the rich in Israel. And then here comes this lowly, humble, poor widow. Exactly the the kind of person that Luke has been drawing attention to throughout his gospel. And she places two small copper coins in the, the collection box. Two lepta. These coins had the smallest value in their day. You should think of our pennies. It was like she placed two pennies in the box. It's about the amount of money you'd leave behind in a give a penny, take a penny tray at your local store. This is humble faith, isn't it? It's not flashy. There's no show. There's no pageantry. Just poverty. Poverty and a willingness to give everything that she had. The scribes wanted the first seats and the first places, first, first, first. And the widow is last, last, last. She's least. But in verse 3, Jesus commends her. He says that she's put in more than all of them. How can he say that? How can he say that she's put in more than all of them? Well, because she's experienced real cost. She gave all that she had, which meant she was left with nothing. You can see Jesus' explanation in verse 4, For they, the rich, all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. That's why she put in more, because it cost her more. The cost was greater for her. The rich gave out of their abundance. Did you know that Bill Gates gave a charitable donation in 2022 worth $5 billion? One donation. I can't even get my mind around how much money that actually is. But I read a Los Angeles Times article that said Gates made the largest charitable contribution of 2022. This is according to the annual ranking compiled by the Chronicle of Philanthropy. $5 $5 billion. Come on. You didn't give $5 billion last year. What happened? But here's the thing. You know how much Bill Gates is worth? The same article stated that his net worth is estimated at $104 billion. Now, is it hard to live life on $99 billion? I mean, someone tell me. I can't imagine that it's difficult to get by on that amount. I mean, if I had $99 billion, I think I'd do okay. Now, this is is an extreme example, but you get the point. Don't be impressed by Bill Gates and his $5 billion gift. It wasn't a big sacrifice. Here's what it means to contribute out of your abundance. It means to give out of excess. It means giving when you know you'll have a lot left over and your comfort will go untouched. This isn't how the widow gave, is it? She gave out of her poverty. She made a real sacrifice. She didn't hold anything back. After she gave, she didn't have anything left over. She gave all that she had. She gave all of her life. That's what that means. She exercised a Luke 14.33 kind of faith. She renounced all that she had to be Jesus' disciple. And that's the kind of faith we see on display here with this poor widow. A a renouncing all that she has kind of faith. Now, how can she do this? What is it that the widow believes that the religious leaders don't? I think her faith is resurrection faith. She's believing God's promise in the scriptures of a resurrected Messiah. And she's believing that she will one day soon be made a son of resurrection herself. Surely this widow is a picture of someone who is considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead. She's a real life illustration of chapter 20, verse 35. She's not living for this age. Her citizenship isn't merely an earthly citizenship. 
She has her eyes on the age to come, and she's living for that age. Her giving all that she has is an expression of the fact that she's living to God. She's living to God, just as chapter 20, verse 38, says that God's people do. So she has faith that the Scriptures teach a resurrection from the dead. And she believes that the Scriptures hold forth a divine, sin-bearing Messiah who will conquer death and rule from David's throne at God's right hand. And this belief has so gripped her that she's confident that she too, one day, will be made a son of the resurrection. So she gives all that she has. She gives her whole life. She acts sacrificially, and she acts in love. Now, as you see this portrait of faith set against a dark backdrop of unbelief, what do you think? How about you, CMC? Are you marked by humble resurrection faith? Are you marked by this kind of faith? I think so. In fact, I, I know so. I'm confident that the answer is yes. You are a chart, church filled with humble resurrection faith. But there's room for improvement. Can you say, Lord, we believe, help our unbelief? Of course. And we're adding to our numbers every week. Our congregation is growing and it's expanding. Praise God. And I want each person here who considers this their church home to be living with wholehearted, humble, resurrection faith. Let's all work together to have one heart of faith that's united in the gospel. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Now what does that mean for you, church, week by week? How does his resurrection help your faith? Well, what did Jesus do? How did he live his life? He believed God's promises. When God lodged his promises in resurrection, Jesus believed in resurrection. He hoped in it. He was confident that God was not a God of the dead, but a God of the living. And this enabled him to live to God. It enabled him to give his whole life as an offering to God. Jesus believed God's promise given to him, sit at my right hand and I will make your enemies your footstool, which again was a promise of resurrection. If God said to him, sit at my right hand, he would surely raise him from the dead. It was a personal promise. Jesus identified with it and he believed it. And when Jesus laid down his life on the cross, when he gave all that he had in your place, brother and sister, as your substitute, when he gave his very life for you, then God did raise him from the dead and indeed seated him at his right hand. God made good on his promise to Jesus. Jesus came to this earth on a mission to overcome your sin and to conquer death. He came in humility and he came in great poverty. You're familiar with 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Jesus didn't seek after accolades and honor. He wasn't arrogant, longing for first this and first that. And he could have. He was God. He was divine. But no, he didn't act this way. He humbled himself, and he became poor for you, brother and sister. He took the form of a servant and laid down his life for your salvation. And out of his poverty, he put in all of his life. He gave everything because he believed the promise. He believed the promise of resurrection. The poor widow in our passage was simply acting like Jesus. She was Christ-like in her faith. She points you to Jesus. And here's the promise that's yours, church. Through your union with Jesus Christ by faith, you will become sons of of the resurrection. Now, ladies, don't stumble over the use of the word son. You too are sons of the resurrection. You will inherit the resurrection promises as sons. But don't worry. The struggle goes both ways because the men in here have to be the bride of Christ. So we all have to get used to the biblical imagery. That is your promise, church. You will be sons of the resurrection. Jesus was raised from the dead and you too will be raised from the dead. It will surely happen. God has said it. Jesus has inaugurated it. And you will experience it. 
The promise is yours. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. That's talking about us. For this perishable body must put on imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. Or 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. They will. That's God's promise of resurrection to you in his word. And it's their church for you to believe. Don't you want to believe his resurrection promise with an unwavering heart? Don't you want to act according to God's word? That's faith, acting according to the promise, hoping in the resurrection by giving up all that you have. So first, let me ask you this. Are you humbly loving with sincere hearts? Are you loving God sincerely? Are you loving others here in this body with sincere generosity? It always begins with our heart before God, doesn't it? So are you acknowledging your poverty before him this morning? Everyone here has far more than two pennies to their name, but I'm wondering if you're readily confessing your spiritual bankruptcy. Throughout the entire gospel, Luke has been laboring for you to see your spiritual poverty Every time you encounter the lame or a beggar or a blind man or a tax collector or a widow, you should see yourself. Your heart before God is lame and needy and blind and unclean and poor. You're a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. And your life is a vapor. It's here today, gone tomorrow. That's humbling. We work and we accumulate we earn and we buy and we provide. And often as we do, pride grows and we begin to view our lives as quite the accomplishment. We start to see our earthly lives as an expensive treasure. And we can view this world as our palace, especially because of American affluence. Maybe you're struggling with the text this morning because you feel like you have so much to lose. If you look with pride on all that you've accrued in this life, then you will be very hesitant to give it up. You'll say, it's too great a sacrifice. But acknowledging your poverty is not thinking that you have all that much. So you have a house. So you have two cars and two and a half children and a white picket fence. So you have money set aside and a robust 401k. Is that really worth as much as you think it is? What will all that do for you in the resurrection? What resurrection prosperity will you gain with more money or more toys or more leisure? I dare say none. Unless you take the whole of your life, everything from your heart to your cell phone, and give it to the Lord. Unless your life becomes a life lived to God. So don't be prideful and unloving. Acknowledge your poverty. What do you have that you haven't received? What will you think when this short life is over and you've passed into eternity? What will your mindset be then? Here's a call this morning for you to come to Jesus Christ with a sincere heart. Come to him authentically with a heart of integrity, which means being honest about your sin, being honest about your poverty, being honest about your need for the Lord Jesus Christ. And for many of us, that means the fresh and daily repentance of the Christian life. Christianity is a life of ongoing faith, isn't it? Ongoing renunciation of all that you have. So it requires ongoing humility and ongoing sincerity. Brothers and and sisters, come to Jesus afresh with a humble, loving heart of faith. And for those among us that are unbelievers, for you who have never come to Jesus honestly and with sincerity, consider what Jesus Christ has done for sinners like you. He came to this earth and laid down his life to atone for sin. He endured the pain and the suffering of the cross so that sinners could be forgiven. And he was resurrected so that sinners like you could be resurrected to a life of joy and peace and fellowship with God himself. And I'm inviting you this morning, dear unbelieving friend, to turn from your pride and hypocrisy and maybe for the first time to acknowledge your sin and your poverty before a holy God. Don't be a Sadducee. Don't be a scribe. 
neglecting to believe the scriptures, acting in hypocrisy in order to maintain a reputable outward appearance, supposing yourself to be rich. These are all delusions of unbelief that only lead to condemnation and judgment. Don't esteem yourself so highly as though your life has self-induced value, as though in your own strength and accomplishment you've become something great. You're a steward. You don't really have possession of your life the way that you think you do. And God, when He decides the time is right, will require your soul. One day, perhaps soon, you will die. And you won't take any of your earth, earthly accumulations with you into the afterlife. You will enter eternity with only your sin and a sure expectation of judgment because you lived your life here for yourself rather than living to God. And as a result, you'll suffer torment and anguish knowing that you ignored the call of Christ and chose to pursue earthly pleasures and earthly gain instead. You'll sit forever under the heat of God's wrath wishing wishing that you had turned to Christ. So I'm beckoning you now, while there's still time, to come to Jesus through faith and repentance. Decide that you're going to live to God. Out of the poverty of your sinful life, put in all that you have by faith. Trust Jesus Christ to take away your sins and to reorder your life and begin to humbly love Him and His people with a sincere heart. This is the call of the gospel. And it can be yours today if you'll have it. Come to Jesus. So friends, all of you, humble yourselves. Put aside hypocrisy. Put aside selfishness. And love God with sincerity, serving His church generously. And what will help you to serve the church generously out of sincere love? The resurrection. Your resurrection. So secondly, let me ask you this. Are you putting your hope in the resurrection. CMC, how's your resurrection faith? Are you living like the Lord Jesus Christ, putting in all that you have because of the promise of resurrection? I want you to. What would help? Let me encourage you to give, not out of abundance, but out of cost. When you give, when you serve, are you hedging? making sure that you have enough time or money or energy left so as to maintain your comfort? Or are you giving sacrificially? Are you putting in all that you have? I have to talk about money for a minute. This passage in Luke makes me think of the churches of Macedonia. Are you familiar with what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8 about the churches in Macedonia? You don't have to turn there. Just listen. I'll read starting in verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and, Paul says, beyond their means, of their own accord, willingly, happily. Your Affliction here in Vermont 2023 and your poverty are not severe, not by any means. Are you overflowing in a wealth of financial generosity toward the church and its saints? Are you not only giving according to your means, but beyond your means and willingly, happily, joyfully? Those are questions I can't answer for you. But resurrection faith answers them with costly financial giving because it banks on the age that is yet to come. How about your time? How about your agenda? Are you giving all that you have by prioritizing the church? Jesus laid down his life for the church. He loved and served and sacrificed for the church. Is that what you're doing with your time and with your energy? Is the church calendar the first thing that goes into your Google calendar? Do you arrange family events and leisure activities and kids' sports around the life of the church? As you plan your summer, are you thinking deliberately about the youth retreat and summer Bible camp? Men, have you resolved to attend the May 13th evangelism event and the May 21st men's night? If someone from the church calls you for help, is your first instinct to say yes? 
Are you willing to flex your agenda in order to serve a brother or sister here at Christ Memorial? Will you happily go out of your way to give help to another saint who needs it? When you're hoping in the resurrection, loving and building Christ's church becomes number one. It does. These are your people. These are your fellow sons of the resurrection. They will be with you in that age, that great resurrection age to come. So I'm just trying to poke a little and and see what you might be holding back. Resurrection faith gives all that you have, and it gives it with joy, because your heart's affections are fixed on the resurrection to come. You can also apply this truth, I think, to your gifts and skills. You can apply it to your station in life. Maybe you have chronic pain, or you have a long-term injury. Maybe you're growing old and just struggling with decreased bandwidth. I haven't seen Mike Baddock at Ben's basketball in years. <laughs> Says his body won't allow it anymore. Perhaps you just can't serve the way you've always been used to serving. Moms, maybe you're struggling with identity because you can't do all the ministry activity that you once could. Or perhaps you feel held back by the duties of motherhood. Singles, are you convinced you'd be more effective at serving the church if only you were married? Is there any reason, brothers and sisters, why you don't feel like you have much to offer? My response is, give out of your poverty. God invites you to give yourself, your life, your heart. He's not asking you to steward someone else's life. He's asking you to lay down your life. So don't compare yourself to others. Don't measure yourself based on what others are doing or how others are giving and serving. Now we're back to pride and hypocrisy and contributing out of abundance. No, Simply give all that you have. You can't give what you don't have. You can't give what others have. Just focus on giving what is yours. Your money, your time, your energy, and give it all. One day, very soon, you and I will be resurrected, ushered into our permanent home. Death will be no longer. It will be, can you believe it? It will be impossible to die. We'll be immortal like the angels. We'll enjoy full sonship. Marriage will be no more. It will fade like a shadow. And the reality to which it points will be ours forever. You know, I love being married. I really do. Sometimes it's hard work, but mostly I just love it. And for those of you who know Shannon, you can understand why. I think marriage is great. I love the companionship. I love the intimacy. I enjoy the unique oneness that comes with marriage. My relationship with Shannon is unlike any other human relationship. But marriage is a picture. It's a temporary picture of a greater permanent reality. One day, one day, dear ones, we will be resurrected and we will have unbroken fellowship, unmarred fellowship with the one who created us and rescued us and saved us. And we will experience pleasures forevermore, fullness of joy in Christ's presence. And we will enjoy a fully consummated marriage with our ultimate bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know all of what that means for my relationship with Shannon, but I'm sure we'll be just fine. Because no doubt we will be enraptured with our Savior and fully satisfied in Him. That vision of the resurrection is yours, CMC. And soon, it will be in your possession. Therefore, labor with me, join with me in giving everything to our Savior. Let's pray together. Lord, we long for you to take these scriptural truths and work them so deeply into our souls that we live in light of the resurrection on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and throughout our weeks. And I pray that we'd come away from this time in your word this morning forever changed and forever more willing to give all that we have. And we honestly acknowledge that we need your grace to do that. Help us to trust you, to believe your promises, and to lay down our lives just as the Lord Jesus Christ did. We're so grateful for him. We ask you to work in our lives in his name. Amen.